Good morning, good evening, everyone. We wanna welcome you to the second lecture in our lecture series on decline. Uh, this is a joint uh, initiative from the University de Firenze and UC San Diego, um, sponsored by the Departamento de Letere y Filosofia in Firenze and the um, Center for Hellenic Studies in the Department of History at UCSD. And we're very, very pleased to welcome all of you to this event that will celebrate the launch of Mira Ballberg's new book. So for introducing Mira's project and introducing Mira's work, I'm going to turn things over to Enrico Magnelli, uh, who can hand over and begin the, the program. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. So uh, good morning everyone in San Diego, good evening here in Florence. We, we are pleased to have with, as a, our distinguished speaker today, Mira Balberg, professor of ancient Jewish civilization. Our goal is to run a workshop on antiquity. This is not simply Greek and Latin, but the whole range of civilizations in the ancient Mediterranean world. And uh, Mira Balberg is uh, an authoritative scholar in this field. She is a very appreciated voice in the Jewish tradition especially rabbinic Judaism and its literary outcomes. She has written extensively in this field. Her first monograph was Purity, Body and Self in Early Rabbinic Literature, University of California Press, 2014. And this was an important contribution to this uh, field of research. We can tell the same, say the very same for her second monograph of three years later, Blood for Thought, the reinvention of sacrifice in early rabbinic literature. Enlighten how rabbinic tradition was far from just preserving the religious, cultural, cultural and literary heritage of the past. Rather, it was a continuous reinterpretation, re-reading and reinvention, re recreating the religious and cultural boundaries of its activity. A third monograph is uh, being published in this very year by Oxford University Press, When Near Becomes Far, Old Age in Rabbinic Literature. This is co-authored with uh, another important scholar, Hein Weiss. In this same perspective, we'll have her lecturing on uh, old age, in late ancient Jewish literature today. This is the subtitle. The title is Decline or Peak. And I think this will be a fruitful key to understand her arguments and her contribution to the whole workshop on, we say decline, but within, within commas. So thank you very much, Mira, and please, we are all eager to listen to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Manieli, for this uh, lovely introduction. And good evening, good morning in San Diego, Buonasera in, uh, uh, in Firenze. And thank you for the or to the organizers for this uh, really interesting and rich conversation for this, uh, um, for this series. 
And let me begin by uh, sharing my screen, please. Okay. So uh, the topic of my talk today is, I'm assuming, a little bit of an exception in, uh, in this uh, series of lectures on decline. I'm assuming or guessing that most of the lectures you'll be hearing in this series are really dealing with decline on a more collective level, institutional or national or political, with a sort of bigger social prism. Uh, the topic that I will talk about today is actually the question of decline in the life of the individual, in the, in the human life cycle. And it pertains to the question of old age and how individuals are experiencing it and how societies are talking about decline as a stage in human life. My um, area of, of expertise is um, cultural history, not so much uh, social history or political history. I will not be talking here about demographics or um, old age as a sort of social or institutional phenomenon, although I can comment on those things, but this is not the big uh, issue for me. Rather, what uh, I'm really concerned with is the representations of old age and their meaning in the cultural conversation and the cultural discourse. And the topic that I will be talking about are the sort of contradictory or um, mutually in tension with each other uh, depictions of old age. On the one hand, uh, its representation is a time of decline, deterioration, sort of uh, going downhill toward the end that everybody knows what it is, um, which is you know death. And at the same time, and this is no less central as a time of peak, as sort of a crystallization of all the good qualities that really bring to perfection what a human being uh, developed all his life. This is sort of the ideal, if they indeed develop this all their lives. And what I would like to discuss with you today is the tension between those two uh, kinds of images. The other reason why this lecture might be a little bit of an exception here is that, as Professor Manieri mentioned, my area of expertise is a minority, a very small minority within the ancient world, and I would even say a minority within this minority. The literature that I am working on was not written in Greek or Latin. It was written mostly in Hebrew and Aramaic. And I'm dealing with the um, rabbinic literature of late antiquity, which was created in Palestine, Roman Palestine and Sasanian Babylonia, more or less between the second and sixth centuries of the common era. This is a very, very rich literature. I'll say a couple more words about it uh, in a minute. But this is a literature that is very much in dialogue with the Hellenistic and Roman and broader ancient Mediterranean world, even though it doesn't always like to show that it is in this kind of dialogue. And this is one of the challenges of working with it. So what I'll try to do today is tell you about this tension between decline and peak in the depiction and the construction of old age in rabbinic literature, and also show you some threads of connection to the ideational words of um, Hellenistic and Roman sources. So the uh, material I will present is taken from a new book, as was mentioned, uh, When Year Becomes Far Old Age in Rabbinic Literature, that I have had the good fortune to co-author with my friend uh, Chaim Weiss from Ben Gurion University in um, Israel. Uh, just came out with Oxford University Press about a month ago, so this is uh, quite exciting to celebrate it uh, with you all today. And uh, because this is really a book of sort of cultural representations and cultural discussions of old age, the collaboration between com someone coming from the direction of history like me and Professor Weiss, who comes from the direction of literature, was very fruitful. And in general, I really want to recommend working together with another scholar. This has been a very edifying and meaningful experience, and I think we in the humanities don't do it enough. So just a couple of introductory words about uh, what we mean by rabbinic literature, what is the, the, the world that I'm working in. So when we talk about the rabbis of late antiquity, we're talking about a particular learned Jewish elite that is distinguished specifically, well, distinguished by many things, but one of the things that um, makes it sort of notable is that it has a commitment to the idea of oral Torah in addition to written Torah. So the Torah is the Jewish name for the well, for the, the Pentateuch or the five books of Moses, but more uh, generally to sort of the biblical revelation. And 
Uh, everybody knows that there is a written Torah. This is what we call you know, the, the Hebrew Bible or the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. But the rabbis also uphold that there is something called an oral Torah, like a whole set of obligations and knowledge and interpretations that were not written down, but sort of were delivered uh, orally. Sometimes it's called paradosis in, in Greek. And uh, th they are the teachers and preservers of this tradition. This is why they are really a minority within a minority, as I said. There are lots and lots of rabbinic texts. It is a very rich literature. It's written, as I said, in Hebrew and Aramaic. It includes a lot of different genres, law, biblical interpretation, storytelling, theology, ritual instructions, uh, some anecdotes about the lives of the rabbis. It's very rich and very diverse. Um, it is all collective. So none of this literature has a known author. It's all just created by a bunch of people who lived in different times. It's very multi-layered and uh, it's quite a challenge to work with it. In addition to that, for the fun of it, our earliest manuscripts are from the Middle Ages. So there's a lot of kind of gaps in what we can know. And you will see that I don't really have very exact dates for this literature. If I can say that something is from the third century, this is a huge accomplishment. So forgive me for not being able to offer more accurate dates for most of what I'll be talking about. But we generally divide the rabbinic period into two parts. The early part, which is approximately from 70 to 250. And from this time, we only have literature from Roman Palestine. And uh, the later rabbinic period, some people also call it Talmudic, which is later from 250 to about 600. And then we have two centers of production, one in Roman Palestine and one in Sasanian Babylonia. The uh, centers are very much in dialogue with each other. Uh, the most famous work that came out of that time is what is called the Talmud. This is something uh, many of you must have heard of. And my examples today will be taken both from the early and from the uh, later literatures. Okay, so now we can really get into it and allow me to open uh, this sort of narration of old age and rabbinic literature with a story. And uh, this is a story that's um, referring to a crisis that took place in uh, the court of the rabbis, the court in which the Jewish sages have, were in the habit of holding their ju jurisdictional and um, interpretive discussions. This crisis took place sometime in the last decade of the first century CE or the first decade of the second one, let's say around the year 100, just to kind of give it a time. Uh, even though the story, this story was written later, it was written around the fourth century. So as the story goes, the head of the court, the, the uh, chief judge of the court, the man named Rabban Gamal uh, Gamaliel was a uh, kind of a tyrant. He never accepted any opinions except his own. He was a uh, very rigid in uh, the way he was um, um, treating the other sages, very critical of them if they didn't agree with him. And at some point, all those sages, all those um, rabbis who were uh, part of the court have decided to rebel against him and impeach him because they couldn't tolerate his tyranny anymore. Then they were looking for somebody to replace him. And they're sitting around and they're thinking who could be the new head of the court? And Everybody is not suitable for one reason or another. One person is not educated enough and one person doesn't have enough money because to be in a position of public leadership in Roman Palestine, you needed money. It was like a paterboli um, position. You needed to use your own funds to do it. And some people were not respected enough in the community. And eventually they come to the suggestion that the most suitable person will be uh, a young rabbi named Rabbi, rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. The B stands for Ben, which is son of. So they reach this discussion and say, rather suggested the sages, let us establish Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah as head of the court, for he is wise, rich, and 10th generation descendant of Ezra. Ezra was a very, very important priest in like the fifth century BCE. So this guy has everything. He's smart, he's talented, he's wise, he's wealthy, and he has this great family lineage. After they decide that he's the suitable person, they come to Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, and they said, would the master consent to be the head of the court? So will you take this on? He said to them, I will go and consult with my, with my household. This means his wife. Rabbis don't like to say that they talk to their wives, but this is what it means. So he went and consulted with his wife. And his wife was not certain. She said to him, 
perhaps they will remove you from office. Like this, this doesn't sound too good to me. You know, you're, you're taking on the role of somebody else. I don't know how much this will last. And um, of course she's right. As it turns out, he will be the head of the court for exactly one day. Uh, it will be a very important day, but it will only be one day. He said to her, let a person use an expensive goblet one day and let it break the next day. So, okay, yeah, maybe I won't be head of the court for a long time, but I was given this opportunity, so I'll take it. But she's still unsure. And she says to him, and this is what's important for our purposes, you have no white hair, which is to say, you're too young, you don't look old enough, and people won't respect you. That day, the, story, the narrator tells us, he was 18 years old. A miracle transpired for him, and 18 rows of his hair turned white. So this man's hair becomes white over, overnight, which allows him to become the new head of the court. Now, uh, by the way, in another version of the story, uh, it's clearly stated that his hair uh, grew white because he was just so tense and, and so nervous about this new appointment. But uh, here it's, a, it's a presented as a miracle. So this little story really exemplifies something very basic in the dynamics of the rabbinic elite. On the one hand, it is very clear that in order to be part of this elite and to, be, you know, to reach a very high rank position in it, age doesn't matter. Elazar ben Azariah was 18, According to another version of the story, he was 16, and that didn't matter at all. He was talented and he you know, had what it took, and this is what was necessary. On the other hand, it is clear that age does matter. The fact that because of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's young age, there's real concern that they won't accept his authority and they won't take him seriously shows that age does matter. And the fact is that change in his looks was necessary in order to bring him into the part. So what we're getting here is some kind of an ambivalent picture. Does age matter or does it not matter? And I think that this dynamics continues certainly in academia you know, to this day, whether you know, explicitly or implicitly. And this ambivalency goes even deeper because in the Jewish literature of late antiquity, there's some kind of a semantic transition in the meaning of the word old or elder, zaken in, in Hebrew which has some certain parallels with what happens in other uh, neighboring civilizations. So, um, you know, in, of course, in, in uh, various Mediterranean community, the, the body that runs the city council or the, the body that has some uh, uh, public responsibility is a, a, a society or a council of elders. We have the, in the Gerusia, we have it in, of course, the Senatus, which comes from the word senex, from old, um, and the same was true for, uh, for Jewish institutions. They were institutions of elders. And what we see is that during those um, sort of centuries leading up to the common era and right after this, the age in these institutions is um, rapidly going down. As uh, many of you probably know, Augustus was appointed as a member of the Senate when he was 19 years old. And we can see the same thing in the Christian communities, in the early Christian communities in uh, Asia Minor, the word presbus, which used to mean like, you know, actually old person. In the Christian churches, there's actually a transition where presbus becomes younger and younger and ultimately just means somebody who holds a position in the church. This is something that we really see happening in this period and Jewish texts reflect that as well. And one of the texts that I think shows this very powerfully is a um, work called The Wisdom of Solomon, which may have been originally written in Hebrew, but it was only preserved in Greek, where the, the poet, it's sort of a, this wisdom literature thing, actually says very explicitly that um, what matters for old age is not your age, it's how wise you are. For old age is not honored for length of time or measured by number of years but understanding is gray hair for anyone and a blameless life is ripe old age. So the, it's like he wrote this about Rebbe Lazar ben Azaria, right? Gray hair is created by, a, by understanding, by uh, uh, phronesis, right? By being somebody who, who lives this, you know, this upright way and living a blameless life, that is what old age is about. So this is really kind of a text that says like, what matters to be old is not how old you are, it's how wise you are. 
The same thing we can see also in rabbinic literature, where we have a variety of statements that actually cancel the connection between old age and wisdom in the sense that anyone who's wise, anyone who's rabbinically educated can be considered old. A recurring phrase, we have it like six times in different places, is that elder, zaken, means nothing other than a sage. So wherever, you know, the Bible says, oh, you should ask the elders, that means ask somebody who's wise. Age doesn't matter. And they have another saying that zaken, uh, old man, is actually a sort of a um, condensed way of saying zekana chokma, that man acquired wisdom. So something's happening around that time. Old people, chronologically old people, seem to be somewhat losing their status in society. It still has the semantic value, but it no longer actually corresponds with something that is uh, related to age. And this is where we, I think the, the, the tension begins to happen. If a society is trying to tell you that age does not matter, that clearly something about it matters a great deal. Why? So what, what's, what's sort of going on here and what are some of the cultural responses to this? So from a, we can actually say that from a, a rather early stage, from very early literary works, from the beginning of history, as my students like to say, um, Old age is really connected to two polarized ends of the intellectual cognitive gamut. On the one hand, old age is associated very deeply with uh, wisdom, experience, um, um, insight. On the other hand, old age is associated with dementia, with difficulty in learning new things, slowness, forgetfulness, all of those things. I'm sure this is all something that you all know. We can find it in various different literatures and uh, among other things in the Hebrew Bible, which is of course sort of the infrastructure for rabbinic literature. And one of the important texts on this, which as uh, we'll see the rabbis did quite a bit with it, is the 12th chapter in the book of Job, a book that is generally about human suffering and terrible things that happen. But in this particular uh, section, Job is talking about the complete power of God that does to human beings whatever he wants and controls them absolutely. And among other things, uh, God actually gives wisdom and takes it away. And Job starts by saying, and this is just a small passage, is wisdom with the aged and understanding and length of days? The answer is no. It's a rhetorical question and the answer is no. With God are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. With him are strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped and makes fools of judges. He deprives of speech those who are trusted and takes away the discernment of elders. So the way in which uh, Job describes the sort of omnipotence of God is to say, don't think that uh, wisdom is a characteristic, a characteristic of old people as such. Wisdom is a characteristic of old people if God wants them to have it. And at some point, if God doesn't want old people to be wise and insightful anymore, he takes it away. So this is sort of how Job deals with this gamut of old people are the wisest and old people are actually losing their, uh, their mental faculties. It's the working of God. In this text from, uh, from Job is the basis for a discussion that appears in, a Mish in the Mishnah, in a, uh, in a tractate, in a treatise called Kinin. So the Mishnah is a legal codex uh, from the third century, probably around 220, 225, something like that. And uh, I spent a lot of time in this work. Most of the Mishnah is rather technical and dry, but usually at the end of treatises, the Mishnah has 63 treatises and at the end of each one of them, there's usually some, some general sayings, about, more didactic sayings about the virtues of studying the Torah and keeping the commandments and things like that. And uh, tractate Kinim ends in the following way. Rabbi Shimon ben Akashia says, the elders of the people of the land, the ignorant people, the uneducated people, the more they age, the more their mind is confused. As it was said, he takes away the discernment of the elders. But the elders of the Torah are not so. The more they age, the more their mind is settled. As it was said, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. What happens here is something very typical for rabbinic literature. 
this rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Akashia, is using this text from the Bible, from the book of Job, and he looks like he's quoting it, but he's actually changing its meaning altogether. What he says is that there really are two ends, two, two polarized sides here. There are old people for whom old age is just something that makes them wiser and adds to their discernment and adds to their insight. And there's also old people who cognitively decline in old age. But it's not, as in the book of Job, that this can happen to the same person based on God's will. Rather, the type of person is what matters. We have a distinction between two kinds of um, old people, the elders of the people of the land, the ignorant, simple people, as it were, and the elders of the Torah, the people who spend their lives studying Torah. Um, this is a very major trope in rabbinic literature, that if you have studied Torah, if you lived the contemplative life, as it were, according to the Jewish tradition, you're going to have a wonderful old age in which you're going to prosper, and it's actually going to be the peak of your life. But if you didn't, it's going to be this horrible time in, of cognitive decline. Uh, it, there are many more iterations of this idea, and I just picked what I think is the most colorful one from a slightly later compilation called uh, Midrash Ecclesiastes Rabba, in which um, our homilist is using a very common literary trope of comparing the different stages in a person's life to uh, the existence of different animals. So uh, this is the description. A one-year-old is like a king, placed on a litter and all people hug and kiss him. A two and three-year-old is like a pig, mired in filth and excrement. A 10-year-old hops like a goat. A 20-year-old is like a horse seeking a mate. When he marries, he's like a donkey because you know, he has to work so hard to get, bring a living. When he has children, he's like a dog. When he turns old, he's like a monkey. That's quite a harsh statement. All that pertains to the people of the land, but see what it says about the disciples of the Torah. This is a quote from the book of King. And King David was old, even though he was old, he was still a king. So uh, for the rabbis, King David was the biggest, the greatest Torah scholar that ever lived. I mean, obviously that's not the historical King David if such a person existed, but the rabbis turned him into somebody who studied Torah all his life. And they use this verb to say, so all of this deterioration of life that ends with this humiliation of old, the old person being like a monkey, that's all true for those ignorant people who don't study Torah. But people who do study that, people who do commit to this life of learning, they're all, in their old age, they will be like a king. And if you notice, uh, life also begins as a king. A one-year-old is like a king. So it's almost like saying that for um, people who study Torah, life is not linear. Like the, the direction of life is not this linear deterioration, but rather it's more like cyclical. You go back to where you started. And we, of course, know this idea of the cyclical um, return to, to childhood in uh, Greek and Roman literature. We know these expressions of uh, dis paidas hoigerontes and uh, uh, stenex dis puer, you know, children, um, that uh, children or, or old people are children a second time. Uh, usually it is not said in a flattering way. It's not a very nice thing to, they don't mean it well when they say that old people are children again. Um, but here it is actually presented as like, you're going back to the stage of being a king. Okay, so where is this idea coming from? On the face of it, you could think we're talking about this religious didactic literature that we have a very simple paradigm here of reward and punishment. Okay, you study Torah, that's a good deed. God approves of it. So you get a reward for your good deed. And there are some very late sources in which this appears this way, but it's actually pretty clear that the rabbis got this motif from the Greek and Roman literature of their time um, and from the motif of trying to distinguish between the people who lived a philosophical life, contemplative life, who have a wonderful, prosperous old age and the terrible old age of people who didn't live this way and just dedicated their lives to the lusts and to the passions. And I'm sure that uh, those of you familiar with this literature are already thinking Cicero's De Senectute on old age, and that is really the most prominent example of this. Um, to clarify, and I'll say a bit more about this uh, later, I don't think the rabbis read Cicero, but I do think they gave expression to sort of a wider motif that they were familiar with and they domesticated into their own culture. Uh, so 
uh, on old age, Decimic Tuta, um, those of you who don't know it, um, it's written around 44 BCE. Um, and it is written in the form of a fictional dialogue between Cato the Elder of you know, the, the statesmen of the second century BCE and two uh, friends who are younger than him, about 50 years younger than him, Gaius Laulius and Publius Scipio, Scipio Africanus the Younger. And uh, Cato picked, uh, Cicero picked Cato as the symbol of ideal glorious old age, uh, as the speaker of how wonderful it is to grow old. And he placed the dialogue in the year 150 BC, so a year before Cato died in the age of 85. And in the course of this dialogue, Cato is trying to, you know, uh, dispel the argument that old age is this horrible, humiliating time in human life, and that it has no pleasure, and it has no, uh, no reason to live, really. And instead, he argues that old age is this wonderful, blessed period for those who know how to grow old appropriately. And how do you know how to grow old appropriately? Well, basically, you have a good old age if you spend your, the younger years of your life as living a little bit like an old person, cultivating the good, you know, cultivating virtue, cultivating, uh, you know, the good, uh, the good measures. Um, he's telling of some of the great accomplishments of the, the poets and philosophers of Greece and Rome, Plato, who, you know, wrote until he died at 81, and, and Sophocles, who won the prize for Oedipus and Colonus when he was 90, and all of that. And what Cicero, in the name of Cato, is saying is that all of those negative stereotypes that have to do with old age only apply to people who already in their youth were sort of uh, frivolous and ignorant, not to people who spend their lives honing their intellectual skills. So just one quote to exemplify this. When Caecilius speaks of the old fools of the comic stage, he has in mind old men characterized by crudelity, forgetfulness, and carelessness, which are faults not of old age generally, but only of an old age that is drowsy, slothful, and inert. So not all old, old people, just old people who kind of have a not very good personality. Just as waywardness and lust are more often found in the young man than in the old, yet not in all who are young, but only in those who are not upstanding, so that senile debility, usually called dotage, deliratio, is a characteristic not of all old men, but only of those who are weak in mind and will. Um, so very similar to what we saw in the Mishnah, except obviously earlier, Cicero says here, there's two, there's different kinds of old people in the same way that there's different kinds of young people. The way you grow old is completely correlated with the way you've lived. And later on, he says that if you've lived a little bit like an old person when you were young, that is, you dedicated yourself to philosophy and you were sort of serious and you didn't uh, let yourself do these frivolous, frivolous, pleasurable things, when you're old, you will be young in terms of your, your mental constitution. Um, and later on, he says that for whoever lives this contemplative life, this life of learning, old age is a pleasure rather than misery, because this person can dedicate themselves to what they wanted to do all their lives, which is to study and uh, do this sort of intellectual exploration. And this is again Cicero, uh, Cicero uh, speaking in the name of Cato. I am now at work on the seventh volume of my antiquities. I am investigating the augural, pontifical, and secular law. I also devote much of my time to Greek literature. And in order to exercise my memory, I follow the practice of the Pythagoreans and run over in my mind every evening all that I have said, heard, or done during that day. These employments are my intellectual gymnastics. These the race courses of my mind. And while I sweat and toil with them, I do not greatly feel the loss of bodily strength. However, the fact that I can do them is due to the life that I have led. For the man who lives always amid such studies and pursuits as mine is not aware of the stealthy approach of age. This is Cicero really going over the top in the somewhat annoying way that he knows how to go over the top. But the idea is very clear here. For people who have studied, for people who live the right way, old age is actually the best time in life. Why? Because you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to exert yourself physically. You, you are no longer expected to be publicly involved and you can just dedicate yourself to what you really love to do with this intellectual activity. And 
In addition, this intellectual activity is also preserving you from the, the damages, from the, the harm of old age. This idea too has very clear echoes in rabbinic literature. And here is a passage from another treatise of the Mishnah, treatise Kiddushin. Once again, the, the piece that ends the treatise, the, the concluding piece. Rabbi Nehorai said, I will put aside every craft in the world and teach my sons nothing but Torah, whose rewards one enjoys in this world, and the principle persists for him in the world to come. And with other crafts, it is not so. When a man comes to illness or old age or suffering and cannot do his labor, he dies of hunger. But with the Torah, it is not so. It protects him from all evil in his youth and gives him purpose and hope in his old age. And we have some quotations uh, from the Bible to prove it. On his youth, what does it say? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. On his old age, what does it say? In old age, they will still produce fruit. Very Ciceronian. And you also see this sort of uh, use of halves and of, of verses in order to create a new idea. So Rabbi Nehorai points to two ways in which the Torah guarantees those who study it blessing and prosperity when they reach old age. First, it preserves, uh, it protects them from all evil in their youth. Why? Because if you live according to the Torah, you make good decisions. You don't follow the passions. You don't, you know, do um, frivolous things. And therefore, you know, you kind of pave the life, uh, pave the path for yourself for a good, decent life. And then second, it gives him purpose and hope in his old age. So when you're old and you actually can't physically engage in very demanding labor, then it gives you something to do, it gives you hope, and it gives you a sense of meaning. Okay, so very much like the, the form of study that Cicero is talking about, um, it prepares old man, or it prepares a person for old age ahead of time by protecting them, and also nourishes a person's life when old age actually comes. Um, so this is a really sort of prominent motif that we see that um, the, the, the reason why some people think that old age is not a good time is because you can't really engage in the pleasures of the flesh. But actually, if you live the right life, which is like the life of philosophy, then you don't want to engage in the pleasures of the flesh and you actually train yourself your entire life not to do that. Um, so, a quote from Cicero, I won't read it because it is, you know, more of the same, but he basically says, yes, okay, if you, if what you want all the time is to just, you know, eat and, and have, and drink and have sex, then yes, old age is not a very good thing. But if you train yourself not to really want these things and not to feel like they're valuable, old age is, is your game. And Cicero did not invent this. He took this probably from Plato. He actually kind of quotes uh, Plato directly in the first book of the Politeia. Uh, in the Politeia, we have Cephalus, the older old man Cephalus, who's talking to Socrates, and tells him that the most wonderful thing about old age is that you don't have to deal with your body anymore. You're free from all of those desires. Um, so just reading this because it is kind of good. In particular, this is Cephalus speaking, I remember hearing Sophocles, the poet, greeted by a fellow who asked, how about your service of Aphrodite, Sophocles? Is, the natural, is your natural force still unabated? I hope everybody knows what is the service of Aphrodite. And he replied, hush man, most gladly have I escaped this thing you talk of as, I have, as if I had run from a raging and savage beast of a master. Like if finally I was liberated from that master to whom I was a slave all my life, I don't have to worry about those passions anymore. I thought it a good answer then, and now I think it's so still more. But indeed, in respect to these complaints and in the matter of our uh, relations with kinsmen and, and friends, there's just one cause, Socrates, not old age, but the character of man. Same, uh, same idea in another form. And again, this is also repeated in different rabbinic texts. I just brought one uh, short example from um, Midrash Genesis Rabbah from the fifth century, which really takes this idea, just turns it on its head. So Plato is saying, um, the passions are like a master, a cruel master to whom you are the slave. And when you grow old, you finally get to run away from that master. You finally get your, your liberty. The Midrash, the, the rabbinic work, takes it and, and turns it on its head and says, 
whoever indulges his passion when he is young ends up being a servant to it to this master at his old age. So um, the passions will actually enslave you when you're old if you're not careful about them when you're young, but the motif is still the same. And of course, the cure uh, to all of those things is study, the study of Torah in the rabbinic tradition, the study of philosophy or engagement in philosophy in, um, for Plato. And in a sense, you know, if, if Plato or Socrates famously said that philosophers spend all their life learning how to die, you could really also say they learn all their life. They, they live all their lives like old people so that when old age comes, they'll have this wonderful, prosperous old age. And finally, really just to kind of cap that, this description of um, old age as replacing the dictatorship as it was of the passion with the dictatorship of rationality uh, with what the Stoics called the hegemonicon, with you know, the, the part that makes the, the um, informed decision. Um, well, as I just said, you can understand that it has very significant echoes in Stoic literature and Seneca, like with everything also makes this point. Um, just to again illustrate just the, how, how prevalent this idea is. I feel that age has done no damage to my mind. This is really your old age is the peak of life. Only my vices and the outward aids to these vices have reached senility. My mind is strong and rejoices that, has, that it has but slight connection with the body. It has laid aside the greater part of its load. It is alert. It takes issue with me on the subject of old age. It declares that old age is the time of bloom. Let us take it as its word and let it make the most of the advantages it possesses. The mind bids me to do some thinking and consider how much of this peace of spirit and moderation of character I owe to wisdom and how much to my time in life. It bids me distinguish carefully what I cannot do and what I do not want to do. Okay, so wonderful. What are we all waiting for? Let's all be old because this is the best time in your life, of course, if you live properly. Okay, so how are we to understand these similarities, these connections between the rabbinic text I showed you and there's many more and the selection of those um, um, Greek and primarily Roman texts? Did the rabbis read all these texts? Probably not. Uh, they read probably some Greek, um, some administrative Greek. I don't think mo most of them read Latin. So how do we explain it? One way of explaining it would really be to explain it sort of on a universal basis. And to say that we have a very relatable phenomenon here, you know, old age is scary. Uh, and at the same time that I think most of us want to get there, it's better than the alternative. Um, what will happen to us and to what extent will we still be us is something we're still struggling with. And with, again, with this fear of what we will become at old age in mind, the most natural thing is to try to create for yourself an explanation of why your old age is going to be great. Why those terrible things will happen to other people and not to you. So, which is, you know, mostly an issue of the genetic lottery more than anything else, but we all still try to do that. And I think that this, there is some universal facet here of people trying to say, I lived my life such that my old age will be great or at least not terrible. But there's more than just the universal question here. And that's the fact that ultimately the Jewish literature of late antiquity and rabbinic literature um, among them is, is really a result, sort of an outgrowth of Hellenistic Judaism. And it's a result, it's an outgrowth of Hellenistic Judaism, even though it is not writing in Greek, but it's still part of that culture. And that um, encounter between Judaism and Hellenism really created this meaning, this encounter of um, between the, the Torah, the nomos, that was defined uh, by Hellenistic authors like a form of philosophy, and this, these values of controlling the passion and cultivating the self um, and creating for yourself a sort of inner truth that will lead you to the right direction. What we see the rabbis doing here is sort of domesticating this Hellenistic ethics of the self with this idea of Torah study with one key difference. In Hellenistic philosophy, um, what really will save you from you know, humiliating old age or you know, the terrible things will happen is yourself. You know, you're really coming down to the core of understanding your true nature, your rationality and so on. Um, and your ability to exercise your own control, your, your own uh, sophrosina and so on. 
For the rabbis, the thing that will save you is out, outside of you. It's the Torah. The Torah is this external uh, power that you need to plug yourself into. So the answer is not within yourself. The answer is within that holy revealed text. But otherwise, we really see those culture encountering on this basis. So that is part of what I wanted to show you today. And by the way, uh, in Christianity, which is actually another child of that encounter between Judaism and Hellenistic culture, uh, this idea will get its own permutation of the holy texts as well as the, the cure for uh, a bad old age and what promises this, this prosperous old age. And this is just a short quote from Jerome. Uh, similar ideas can be found in John Chrysostom. Old age, however, I repeat my warning. If men have trained their youth in honorable accomplishments and day and night have meditated on the Lord's law, become more learned by time, more subtle by experience, more wise by lapse of years, and reaps the sweet fruits of an ancient study. So, okay, all this is very idealized and uh, positive and, you know, seems to be problem free and talks about, you know, and our deep concerns about old age and how we deal with them. But of course, these texts also have a social function. Both Cicero and Seneca are in the middle of their 60s when they're writing these texts. Um, and obviously, they are living through a lot of political um, issues that have to do with the circumstances in which they live. But it's also pretty clear that they're concerned about the question of, are they still relevant? What is their place in political life? Do they belong to a world that no longer exists? I think both of them were troubled by these questions. So the question of what do old people have to offer in the public sphere was a meaningful one for them, and I think for everyone else. Actually, you know, th there are some treatises on um, how old people should be involved in public life. Plutarch wrote one of them, and so did others. So this really brings us back to the story of Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, with which we started, in which we have this sort of complicated institutional element having to do with old age. On the one hand, there is this idea that old age should not matter. Because if a person has lived a good life, a right life, if a person is upstanding, if a person is part of uh, whatever elite is defining itself as such, then it doesn't matter that they grew. But at the same time, it also doesn't matter if a person is young, because the right person, if they lived according to, uh, to social expectations, should sort of be old when they're already young. So something is happening here. Clearly old age is something that matters a great deal. And then we have all those texts that are working very hard to say, no, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and I think that this tension is a tension that is worth grasping. First of all, because I think it's critical for understanding some of the cultural representations of old age in um, ancient societies. And uh, I think it also helps us understand some things that are not spoken about in our own society today. I'm going to uh, finish with one very, very short story that I think exemplifies this exact tensions and may leave us with some you know, room for thought. And it's going to show us how this definition of who is old and what is the definition of old age, how it really kind of comes to the fore when there's a real intergenerational um, encounter. And this is a story from the Palestinian Talmud from uh, about the fourth century CE. Really short. Rabbi Hila and Rabbi Yaakov Bar Idi were sitting and studying. So two rabbis were sitting and studying. Shmuel Barba, a man who is older than them but is not a rabbi, so his status in the world of Torah is lower, was passing by and they rose before him. They rise before him because he's older than them. That's the polite thing to do. He said, I have two things on you, which is basically, I can fault you twice for rising before me. I have two accusations against you for what you did. First, I am not old. And second, the Torah must not rise before its son. So this man gets upset that uh, the two rabbis rose before him. And he says, first of all, I'm not old. I'm not worthy of you. Um, um, the fact that you're rising before me shows that you think that I'm old and I'm not. And second, you are Torah scholars. You are currently studying Torah and you are, you're embodying the Torah as you're studying it. I'm just the son of the Torah. I'm in this sort of, in this, in this childlike position 
in relation to the Torah. And therefore, you should not rise before me because right now you're embodying something that's greater than me. So you have here on the one hand, an old man who says, I'm not old. I don't want to be recognized as old. And I don't want the honor ostensibly associated with being old. Treat me like a colleague, treat me like a peer. And as a matter of fact, when it comes to the study of Torah, you are older than me. You are embodying old age when you're studying the Torah. At the same time, the only reason why this Shmuel Barbach can berate the rabbis the way he does and, and you know, take them to task and say like, you have behaved badly, he couldn't do it if he was actually younger than them. He can only do it because he's older than them. So he's absolutely taking advantage of the fact that he is older and has this kind of status to say, well, I'm not old, even though I'm like berating you like I'm older than you. So I hope that this gives you a little bit of a um, picture of the unresolved tensions having to do with old age, how much it matters and how much it doesn't matter and how much uh, cultural energy is going, is going into saying that it doesn't matter. And I think that I will uh, leave us with these open-ended issues and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Mira, for this rich and very, very interesting lecture. It was a pleasure to follow you on these uh, various paths between Jewish, Greek, and Latin culture. Well, uh, I think we'll have, uh, we have a good, some, more than half an hour for discussion. As Professor Wartz wrote at the beginning of the lecture, please, if someone wants to take part in the discussion, just write in the chat. You can write C for comments or Q for questions. Uh, I see that we already have a question in the chat by Geoff Nathan. Uh, Geoff, are you, are you here with us? You, you can also. Oh, uh, yes, I am, sorry. Hi, uh, I, I, hi, hi. Uh, this is a really great uh, question. I'm sorry, I'm on two different Zoom calls at once and this is on my phone, so I apologize for the craziness. Um, I really love that uh, talk and, and I was reminded very much of Seneca's 26th moral epistle where he's coming to terms with his own old age. One of the things that's really interesting about it though is, is that uh, he orients the question forward rather than looking over the course of his life and it's really, um, associated with this idea of being willing to let go of life, that love of life. And I really wanted to think about what you're saying um, about social context and how this, this kind of attitude, which is, I, I think, much more heavily um, dictated by Stoic principles, uh, fits into the, sort of this, this larger notion of, of, of how old age is constructed uh, in antiquity. Um. So are you referring specifically to the, 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 the death as sort of the horizon of this? Right, exactly, okay. exactly. So the looking forward, that, that's, the, that's the control, that's the sofrasine, you know, associated yes. with it. Yes, thank you for this question. Um, so it is really interesting to, um, to look at that because I think that this is where um, the, there is a, both a difference and convergence. On the one hand, um, something that we do find much more in the philosophical traditions, but in the Stoic tradition is really the study that you should not be attached to life. And old age, I think that to some extent it is, um, I think uh, Seneca in this letter is really sort of, it, it's almost like Phaedo, it's also it comes sort of Phaedo there, saying this is the beginning of the release of your soul from your body, in a sense. This is the beginning of this sort of disintegration uh, that is a good thing because it, is, it allows the letting go um, to, to get better in a sense or to, to be um, better suited for, for what's happening. So 
I think that, and, and I don't think it's a wonder that, you know, Seneca, that uh, Cicero chose to place the dialogue a year before Cato's death. I think that this willingness to accept death uh, graciously and, um, and is, is very much related to that thing and, and has to do with, you know, everybody um, adhering to their social role. In the rabbinic context, it's interesting because the rabbis absolutely do not have that kind of you should be ready to let go. They do not do anything to idealize death or to you know, the letting go of death. Um, it's very much not their, um, their line of, of responding to this. But one thing that is very interesting is that the rabbis are very concerned about how they're going to be remembered after they die. And the way they're going to be remembered is by people relating their teachings, quoting them, repeating what they said. And they know that rabbis are cited or, or quoted much more after than that they die than during their lives. So something about, and I think we can see it in some sources, something about the, you get to the peak of your wisdom in old age is construed in some context as preparation for the time in which you will be nothing but wisdom, which is when people will just quote what you said, when you will just be this sort of disembodied, um, collection of traditions that you're embodying. And that is something that I think does become a prominent motif, not so much, you know, being ready to let go, but that transition toward, uh, I am now just like pure Torah without a body because that's how people are quoting me now. So that's actually a really excellent um, thing to mention. Thank you. Well, we have uh, Idol Kelting, please. Yeah, that was, that was great. Thanks, Mira. Uh, my question is um, a, a kind of basic one around the fact that uh, partially this is a limitation of evidence so that it's a lot of uh, men talking about old age in a way that's very masculine. So it's this kind of uh, just uh, guys with their minds doing some good studying or whatever. And Wealthy course, guys, I will add. Yeah, there, there's yeah. an evidentiary absence about how female old age is maybe just not there to be seen. But I'd, I'd wonder for you to kind of hypothesize about how and in what ways this valorized old age is gendered and what options that gives for a kind of valorized female old age. Okay, this is wonderful. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond to that. Um, so I, first of all, I have to pay a debt. I see uh, a T. Parkin in our participants list and I'm assuming that this is Tim Parkin who wrote the magnificent book on um, old age in ancient Rome. Uh, it's a person I know only from his writings, but this book would not exist if it weren't for him. So um, I refer everyone to this wonderful book, Old Age. Uh, I'm probably misciting the, the um, title of the book, but uh, it is uh, the de description of actually gendered aspects of old age exists in Tim Parkin's book as well and highly recommended. Um, I will say something about the representation of older women in um, rabbinic literature, which is fascinating and does correspond with some things that we see in Greek and Roman literature. We don't have a ton about old women, but there is one very clear uh, notion, and that is that older women become much more wild, as it were, much more independent, much more defying of social boundaries, and much more kind of active in the public sphere than they've been throughout their lives. So, when we do encounter in rabbinic text stories about older women, they're usually out there doing quote unquote crazy things that they wouldn't be doing in sort of a traditional patriarchal setting. Um, sometimes in ways that are very humiliating to their sons. The stories are told from um, the perspectives of their sons. And this seems to be a motif of the older mother going crazy, that seriosa matris, as we have it in one of Opian's codes, that the mothers that become just you know, demanding and um, um, uns, you know, unsated and all of that. And um, the other thing that I think um, should be mentioned is that, um, and that is another thing that corresponds with some of the things we find in the Roman literature, older women are more sexual. So uh, Horace, Juvenal, some of those satirists are describing this sort of grotesque image of the old woman who is still, you know, sexually voracious, they're supposed to make it, you know, funny. It's actually quite tragic. And that is also a trope that we find in rabbinic literature, um, old women who are finding um, 
this sort of new unfulfilled passion, sometimes very misguided passions. One of the most scandalous rabbinic stories is about an older mother who basically develops a crush on her son. So, um, but you're very right that the perspective is limited. And I think that what I appreciate about the rabbinic text and why I enjoy them is that I think they want to be Cicero, but they don't quite succeed. I think they want to be, you know, to, to present these organized crafted treatises and why, you know, a life of Torah is so good and so perfect. But because the, the authorship is so collective and the texts are so multi-layered, there's all these things are creeping through the seams in which, you know, it's not so, it's not so happy. It's not without complication. There's different voices. There's lots to be afraid of. So uh, thanks for asking that. Well, uh, Edward was also asking, can we have the option to restart our videos for the q and A? I I think Q&A may mean question and answers. Does it? Thank you. So please feel free to restart your videos. We, we have no problem with videos. It's only the microphones that if many are operating may cause some uh, overburdening to the connection, but no problem with the videos. Well, we have Roberta Franchi and then T. Parkin. Roberta, please. So thank you very much for your very interesting paper. And I would like to ask you one question. What kind of real impact did such representation of old age as a wisdom guided by the Torah have on the Jewish society? I think that it's very interesting question. Thank you for this question, uh, which is very hard to answer. Um, and it is very hard to answer because of you know, the lack of sources from uh, from that period that we have. This is one of the very frustrating things. We rarely have you know, any archeological or epigraphical evidence between the second century and about the fifth century. So it's a little bit hard to say. Um, I would say that I think that the main impact that uh, these kinds of representation gave was mainly in the obsession with Torah study uh, in all ranges of society and in and sort of turning it into the uh, universal ideal. So as Ted was mentioning, this is clearly something that was created by a very small group of elite men who had the leisure and the money and the time to dedicate to this life. But they built so seriously this idea that if you will not study Torah, you're basically going to have a horrible life and you know, you're going to have a humiliating old age, that this did have impact in creating massive institutions of study pretty much in all uh, strata of society. So even people from fairly poor families were, got some kind of basic education or at least were, meant, were, were taught to feel inadequate or taught to feel like they were not real Jews if they did not engage in some of that study. So I would say that the, the biggest real life impact of these texts was not so much how old people were treated because that I, I don't really have any information about, but more in how education was used. Um, so, so I see that uh, Professor Parkin. So thank you very much. So especially for children, no? know? Yes, 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 I would say so. It was more about how to live when you're young than when you're yeah. old. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah. We have a message from T. Parkin. Mm -hmm. He cannot speak because it's uh, four o'clock a.m. in his country and uh, <laughs> his family is sleeping. But he writes, I really enjoyed your talk and will buy your book. So this is a, there's no bigger compliment. So thank you very much. And now we have another question, yeah. We have Professor Edward Watts, Edward, please. Uh, th that was great, Mira. I really, really enjoyed that. And so one of the things that, that I'm just sort of puzzling with in my mind um, 
is that of course we're scholars and the people writing these things are scholars. And so we're sort of naturally predisposed to accept their idea that the life of the mind is desirable. But I think what's interesting is, um, you know, one of the things that Cicero and others respond to is an anti-old discourse from people who are young and middle-aged. But what they're engaging in is a kind of anti-young discourse where they say basically you're only good if you're already old. And so I'm wondering what we can do as scholars to try to um, maybe recover that young discourse. You know, what is the young discourse about youth that's affirmative and positive? Um, and can we get it? Uh, or are we kind of stuck with this anti-young discourse because of our own inclinations to favor the views of people who are kind of like us? So I don't know if that, there's a way to answer that question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm really happy about this question. Um, so, you know, as uh, we were working on, on this chapter, one of the um, uh, books that we were reading is a recent book by um, Martha Nussbaum called um, Aging Thoughtfully, which is, which is, a, which is the Desenic Tutte of, of 2015, you know, really, and, and quoting Desenic Tutte extensively, but also really trying to produce a new one. And, uh, and she's really writing from that scholarly perspective of like, well, as academics, as people who, you know, have this life of the mind, isn't old age wonderful and doesn't it not matter at all and so on. Um, and there was something, certainly reading it from, from somebody who was attempting to replicate this discourse in the 21st century, there was something that I felt was very tone deaf and very unaware of some of the um, complexities, even of academic departments in which presumably age is supposed to not matter at all. And yet we realize that it does. So uh, I really appreciate your question because that's something I thought about a lot. Two things I can say about this. One is that we do have, um, and this is again what I like about rabbinic literature, there's also some things from the perspective of younger people. And I, there are two that I find very informative. One is that we actually have traditions about younger people who are trying to pretend that they, that they are older than they actually are. So that story about the, like, the guy whose hair is turning white when he's 18, there it's a miracle. But we have actually stories about rabbis who are using like leaning on slaves or sometimes leaning on their um, disciples to feign looking old, to feign looking, you know, like this having this sort of bodily decrepitude. And then all of a sudden something happens, you know, if somebody falls down or they manage to lift them up, like, you, you can do this? It's like, of course I can do this. I'm 26. I'm just pretending to look old so that I'll be respected like an old person. So that's, um, I think that sort of game of identities is something that is happening on both sides. The other thing that I think that we do find in terms of the, the voice, the younger voice is rabbis who, um, younger rabbis who are really stifled by very demanding, overbearing older masters who are not, not only not accepting their opinions, but also really trying to um, restrict what they can do in the name of you're too young, you're not yet fit to do this. And we absolutely get the perspective of this has been over there, basically because they're afraid, and I'm going to be very blunt here, they're afraid that they're irrelevant, they're afraid that they're going to die, they're afraid that they've lost all their impact, and now they're trying to hold me back even though I am much more suitable for this than they are. So these are perspectives that are absolutely coming to the fore. And I will say more, more generally about this book, what I really admire about rabbinic literature is that because of its multivocality, because it's so, you know, it has so many layers, both voices are always coming through. So we have a chapter about, um, we call it you know, adult children and their older parents. And we get both the perspective of adult parents who are afraid of becoming a burden, afraid of their children, you know, basically letting them go or, or throwing them away somewhere and feeling like they've lost their ability to, have, to be meaningful presences in the life of their children. And we have the voices of adult children who are driven crazy by their old parents' demands and um, the, the troubling change of power relations and all of that. It's all there. So yes, um, rabbinic literature is weird and, and really great. Thank you for this question. Well, the next question 
Xanthi Pimarkenskov, please. Yes, uh, I'm from UC San Diego, not a humanist. Um, in the Christian iconography, God is depicted as an old man. So, but in ancient Greek, the ancient Greek gods like Zeus are mature men, are not old men. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems then that uh, Christianity was more influenced uh, by Judaism uh, in terms of the concept and the perception of God uh, as, an, uh, as an image, so to speak. The, uh, the well, Christianity has both. That's the magic of Christianity. It has both the old God and the young God. That's, I think, the, in Christ. Right. That, that's, uh, that's the brilliance of it, in a sense. Well, so, um, we, on the other hand, uh, Christianity goes further and promises an afterlife, while Judaism does not. Uh, so, that is closer to, to the philosophy of the ancient Greeks uh, rather so, than. A religion, so to speak, is more of a philosophy rather than a religion. So we have to actually draw a distinction in time here because uh, the Hebrew Bible does not have a concept of an afterlife at all. Yes, that's um, what I'm saying. But the rabbis in late antiquity absolutely do. So uh, it, it changes in Judaism. Um, and some people think it changes in Judaism as a result of the contact with Christianity. But for the rabbis, there is absolutely a concept of afterlife. Um, so just to uh, you know, respond to your, to, to your interesting comment, um, one of the most interesting motifs in rabbinic literature about old age is the concern that God is old. And I think that has to do actually with the challenge of Christianity as the new religion, the younger religion, the religion that is more attractive, more dynamic in a sense. And we see some um, treatments especially of Bible interpretation in rabbinic literature, where the rabbis are saying, is God now too old to perform miracles? Is, has God, has our God, the, 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 you know, the Jewish God, who, who they absolutely think about as old, they call it the ancient of days, is that God too old now? Which I think relates to the question, is Judaism getting too old? And I think that um, there are elements in the Christian Jewish debate in the, um, mainly in the third, fourth centuries, that do have a little bit of a dynamic of the young putting down the old and the old putting down the young. So that intergenerational clash is actually um, projected on those two religions. So thank you for mentioning that. Further questions or comments? We have our colleague Barbara Del Giovane who writes, thank you very much for, to Mira for this fascinating paper. I'm sorry, but I have to leave for parental reasons. Further questions? Please, we, we still have some time, so. Oh, Jamie yeah. Marvin, please, Jamie. Yes, yes, all. Hi, Jamie. Hi, oh, I, oh <laughs> sorry, I thought I couldn't actually talk. So I don't know if I'm asking this right, but let me let me give it a shot. Uh, so there's two related questions. Oh, and by the way, thank you. This was great. Um, so is there any sort of differentiation that you can tell in the sources between the sort of knowledge that kind of God imbues some of these people when he chooses to give them wisdom or the sort that kind of comes just naturally with old age? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's related to the second question, is there like any sense of how exactly it is that the Torah provides people with the wisdom, um, you know, or at least the self-control? <laughs> I'm kind of thinking to um, Julian, of course, and where he talks about uh, wisdom is something that is able to uh, provide the young, the experience, if it's, if it's well-written, um, that gives them kind of the wisdom of that only comes through old age. And his idea is very clearly that it's, almost like a substitute for like the experience that you would have only by like engaging in the real world. 
uh, like, you know, kind of like seeing the things yourself, which seems very different from when he talks about the wisdom that, you know, kind of God just kind of goes and go boom. Now you have like this understanding that illuminates your mind. So I'm wondering if there's a similar sort of thing going on here too. Um, there is a diametrically opposite thing. Wow. <laughs> actually, yes. Uh, thank you for this question. It actually uh, relates to my, my current book project, which is about memory and, and forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. So a very interesting thing is that um, in rabbinic, the rabbinic world, knowledge is almost exclusively textual knowledge because of the centrality of the Torah as a written text and then a text that has a whole host of oral traditions that are also texts. They're also to be memorized and they're organized like texts. Um, knowledge is really perceived as um, the, 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 the text that you memorize effectively, the text that you memorize and your ability to understand them. And experiences, actually lived experiences are inferior. So one of the tropes that we see is um, in, in several places, and I really love it, is an older rabbi is uh, teaching and he says something, he, he uh, relate something based on his own experience. He says, oh, you know, when I was in the temple, I saw that the high priest did this and that. Or when I was um, attending somebody's burial, I saw that the, the protocol for the burial was like this or like that. And then his students say, but you taught us differently. The text that you taught us, the text that we all had to memorize, said something that is uh, opposed to what you just taught us. And then the rabbi responds and says, like, you know, you are right. I forget what my eyes and my ears have, have my eyes have seen and what, um, what my hands have done, but you will not forget what your ears have heard. So it's almost the opposite, right? Like that what you did with your hands, what you saw with your eyes, that's inferior knowledge. The textual knowledge that you gained, that's what's valuable. So I think that... Um, this is, this is sort of how they construct the nature of this divine um, knowledge. It's knowledge of, it's revealed knowledge. It's knowledge of texts that are either from God directly or, you know, uh, revealed through some kind of, a, um, um, let's say, a Holy Spirit of sort, if I could use that term. And um, that is, and that's your, the job of the individual to memorize those texts. And the more they live, the more texts they actually can you know, memorize. Um, but experience is really, really relegated. There is one text where there's a question, and I'm sorry, this is part of the cultural chauvinism of the rabbis, uh, which I, I cannot do anything to deny, but um, there's a question of whether, what is the kind of respect that is, should be afforded to old people who are not Jewish? Um, which the rabbis are actually discussing because, you know, uh, non-Jewish old people presumably do not have that kind of Torah excellence. And the answer is you should still respect them because they have had so many adventures, because they've had such a, you know, rich experiential life. So they still, you know, have something going for them, but obviously it's inferior. Thank you. Great question. Someone else? We still have some 10 minutes. I can jump in with another question if, if that's okay. Love to. Uh, Welcome. A basic question is just about the kind of individualist kind of perspective of solutions to old age and how much uh, another text that I was thinking about when you were talking about the De Senectute, uh, the De Amakitia, like basically how much having other people around is supposed to be a part of the solution, uh, which is in some ways kind of there in their kind of community making around the, the Torah, but is also kind of some of the perspective is kind of turning within and just being a kind of walking mind. Uh, in that kind of turn to within, how does that sit with the kind of sociality as a solution for uh, or prerogative of uh, old age? Thank you. Uh, great question. And I think that in this respect, uh, yes, community is very important. And um, there is actually, I think, an insight in some of the rabbinic texts that the most lethal thing about old age is loneliness, which uh, I think was true then as it is now. Um, there is a fantastic story, a very, very touching story about, uh, and this is a, actually, again, a, a motif that we um, all know from um, 
a variety of, of Greek and Roman sources as well. And actually, uh, Barbara del Giovanni, who just left, is the person who told me about this um, text, I think by Varro, about the, uh, the 60 year sleepers. So, uh, and we have this, this is all over the place, appears in various uh, things, people who go to sleep for a very, very long time and basically wake up old. There's a story like that in rabbinic uh, uh, literature as well. A man who falls asleep for 70 years, wakes up, the world has changed, the, the trope is familiar, but the thing is that now this person is very old and he tries to go back to the study house and to be engaged in the community that he used to live in. But what happens then is that nobody recognizes him. He goes to the study house and everybody recites his teachings. Everybody still acknowledges him as an authority in terms of his teachings, but nobody recognizes him, the individual, as their friend. He has no place in the world. And he actually then begs for mercy and, and dies. He asks for his own death and gets it. And the story concludes with uh, an Aramaic maxim. Said in Aramaic, it's ochavruta o mituta, either companionship or death. So that idea of you know the old person who's teachings are respected, whose name is respected, but he himself cannot get that kind of companionship that's so necessary is actually seen as the cause of his death. So yes, they, they didn't write a text like De Amikitia, um, but I think they absolutely had the sense that um, that kind of relationship, again, mostly organized around study was the only thing that would actually keep you alive uh, when you're old. So thanks for that. Further questions? Uh, Mira, may I, I ask a question myself? Please, thank you. Well, uh, to the number of texts we have to take into account on this topic, I would possibly add Philo of Alexandria, who often exploits the uh, opposition between youth and old age, usually with his own allegorical bias. Uh, so um, my, my question, but it is, uh, it's a, a real question, not a rhetorical one. May we consider the possibility that some rabbis could read some parts of Philo's uh, huge amount of writings? Thank you. Um, okay, so I love, uh, I love uh, Philo of Alexandria deeply. And the question of whether the rabbis could have been familiar with him is an excellent one. Um, I think that there is a good reason to assume that they were familiar with some of his materials. Um, not all of them, but I think most of his uh, things that were more uh, Bible interpretations, like the question and answers on Genesis and Exodus, I'm pretty sure they were familiar with it. What is really interesting is how much they tried to hide it. And this is, to me, one of the, the most intriguing things about the rabbis. Like I said, they are products of the Hellenistic world. And um, some of them got, I think, a, a, a Greek education, especially the ones that uh, were of the higher classes. But they're working very hard to disguise that and to not to make that known. And one of the things that I, I find so challenging about the rabbis is that we, we sort of, you know, like I said, they, they do not try treatises like, you know, de amikitia or de senectute or de anima or anything like that. They are, it's all sort of wrapped inside those law interpretation and Bible interpretations. So um, I think that the answer to your question is that they were familiar with at least some of what Philo wrote for sure. And they didn't want us to know about that. Um, and they, they sort of, the other thing about them is that they pretended that they didn't live in a Roman empire. They pretended that they lived in a world that still had Jewish sovereignty, still had a Jewish king, that still had a Jewish temple. So their literature is very bizarre insofar as that it's sort of a fantasy literature or much of it um, about a world that they don't really live in and they, disguise how much they are connected to the Hellenistic world, which is curious, but uh, that definitely had a lasting impact on um, centuries of scholarship. And I'm glad that I have an opportunity to show that they apparently are 
familiar with these things, even if they're not reading them directly, they know them with mediation. And I think that Bello was one of those mediators. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if we have no further questions, uh, let me thank you everyone once more and leave the microphone to Giovanni Cecconi for final uh, information, communications and greetings. Please, Giovanni. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. It was a great, uh, a great lecture, a great debate. And uh, so I think I, I would like to thank uh, Mira for her lecture and uh, <clears throat> also Enrico for his uh, conduction of the debate that last, lasted uh, 40 minutes. So to demonstrate the interest that, that was uh, aroused by, by the topic, by the team, and also by uh, the way it was developed. So um, I am very happy for all this. And uh, the date is for May 14. So I, <clears throat> I want to communicate that next lecture will be May 14. And the lecture will be talked by Veronica Bucciantini, a colleague of Florence. And she will, she will talk about uh, this uh, subject, the, the widening of the ancient world, the new Eastern boundary of the inhabited world after the expedition of Alexander the Great. And uh, just uh, 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 one more word to say that I hope that we, uh, we will be even more numerous numbers. And I invite uh, all colleagues and all participants to spread the news of these lectures to students and friends. I'm very happy if uh, all this uh, continue that way, but uh, possibly even with um, a, a wider audience. But I'm very, very happy of uh, how we are going on um, with our initi initiative. So many thanks you all and to the next time. Bye bye. Here is a photo of the lecture uh, announcement. So next time, um, this is the topic and this is the information. So we hope to see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mira. Thank you, all, everyone. Thank you, Enrico. I think we can stop Thank the recording. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Tell me